to the Online Autism Summit. I'm Rhiannon Crisp, Occupational Therapist and the founder of Homebase Hope. Today we are talking about stepping out of the darkness and into the light as parents of autistic children. I am thrilled to be speaking with Christy Forbes, who is an autism and neurodiversity support specialist and the director of Intune Pathways. She is an educator, accomplished childhood behavioural and family specialist, and most importantly, a parent to four autistic daughters. Christy herself was also diagnosed autistic at 33 years old. Christy is a national speaker on topics ranging from autism and neurodiversity to parenting children with diverse needs. She is a passionate advocate for the neurodiversity movement and helps to create custom-made, joyous lives for the extraordinary family. Welcome, Christy. Thank you for having me. That's quite a mouthful there, that last part. (laughs) Ah, well, you've got a lot of things to add to your name. Um, It is such a pleasure to have you on and I'd love it if we start with your autism journey and where it all began so we can get a bit of a background information and insight into that. Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess it all began when I was working as an early childhood educator and I was working with children with diagnoses of what was then termed Asperger's syndrome and it was always boys. Always boys, always Asperger's. And even with the training that I had provided, I still didn't quite have a really decent grasp on what that meant. So, you know, I've always been a person who's just kind of accepted people as they are anyway, but I always found it quite an enigma what Asperger's really was or what autism was. So then I moved into teaching primary and secondary. And again, always boys, always Asperger's. And so I learned as I went along by connecting with the children that did have the diagnosis and just learned about, you know, different characteristics and mannerisms. Uh, But I guess it wasn't until in 2011, my now almost eight-year-old was born. She was my third daughter. And look, she was, I think she was about four months old and I knew she was autistic. And it wasn't, it wasn't a knowing based on qualifications or work experience. It wasn't because of anything that I'd read or heard or seen. It was the knowing that comes from intuition. I just knew she just had a very different energy to my other girls. So I, um, you know, I spent many sleepless nights researching, trying to figure out what it all meant, you know, how I could support her. In that time, I was taking her to professionals who were telling me, no, she's not autistic, she's absolutely fine. And of course she was fine, but the language that was, you know, used around a child being on the spectrum was quite alarmist. So everything changed from there on. I just had this new understanding of what autism meant. And I think, you know, in the following years was when the DSM-5 came into place and Asperger's was taken out of that and our understanding of what autism is began to evolve. Hmm. So you spoke then about your third daughter who you knew immediately was on the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you're, you've got three other daughters and they too are autistic. That's right, yeah. So I guess, you know, reflecting back on the fact that the experience I had was with boys um, diagnosed with Asperger's, you know, the presentation of autism in boys and girls or across gender diversely can be profoundly different. And if we look at, um, you know, gender stereotypes and roles that we have perpetuated in society, it's, it's more probably more acceptable to see a little girl in the library at lunchtime reading a book than it is a boy. You know, boys typically when I was young would be out on the footy field kicking a footy and if you didn't fit into, say, a sporting group or something that was predominantly considered um, to draw males, then 
it would be obvious that you were different. Girls, not so much. So there's a lot of differences there in how autism presents. So I didn't know until my eldest, who's 21 this year, I didn't realise until she was 16 that she was actually autistic. I just thought, you know, looking at my own family history, I thought, okay, she's like me. She's anxious. She's a gifted learner. She struggles with certain things. There was, you know, other characteristics and comorbidities like OCD or irrational fears and phobias. And I just thought she's like me. And my other thought was, what am I not doing right to support her? So I think parents fall into that a lot as well. But look, she was the last, the last of our entire family to be picked up as being on the spectrum. So when did you come to the realisation that you were two on the spectrum? How did this all evolve? <laughs> it's so, you know, I think about it today and I just think, how did I miss this? Honestly, how did I miss it? Um, there was actually a moment, this defining moment for me. My, my little one that I mentioned before, who was the first that I realised was autistic, and she's non-verbal and has significant support needs. So, you know, in the physical sense, it was much more obvious. But at the time, she was about 10 months old and she was in the high chair and she was having a hard time with feeding. And one of my other children was... You know, part of their anxiety is that they'll ask the same questions over and over, but what they're actually seeking is reassurance and comfort and security. Now, I didn't know this at the time, and I just felt completely overwhelmed this one morning. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to explode. I need a timeout right now. And I announced to everybody, I'm just going to have a timeout for five minutes. I went into my daughter's bedroom. And I was in there alone and I laid down on the bed to take a moment for myself. And I just became acutely aware of what my body was doing. My leg was swinging back and forth. I was looking at the letters, wooden letters that I put on my daughter's wall of her name. And I was in my mind counting forwards and then counting backwards and then making number patterns in my mind. And at the same time, I was tapping my fingers nervously and my breathing was trying to regulate my body. And I don't know why I'd never been aware of those things before, but in that moment, I realised and I just, I gasped out loud and I sat up on the bed and I said out loud, oh my God, I'm autistic. And I still get chills now just thinking about it because it was that moment that I just thought, oh, this makes sense. How did I not know? So, yeah. <laughs> wow. And that's incredible. We are going to be diving into that on the Home Base Hope podcast. So if anyone wants to learn more about Christy's journey, about women on the spectrum and um, getting a diagnosis later on in life, we're going to be exploring that more in the podcast. Um, now, you have been on a big autism learning journey and curb yourself mm -hmm. um, and your family embraces autism and celebrates autism as an identity and a culture. Can you tell us what this means and what this looks like for you and your family? Yeah, so look, one of the greatest blessings in my life was the writings of autistic adults and the neurodiversity movement. Um, and I think that that's grossly misunderstood. I know that, you know, a lot of parents hear about the neurodiversity movement and if they have a child with significant support needs or who might be non-speaking, um, they might think that it doesn't support my child. How can a movement or, you know, a paradigm, a way of thinking about autism support my child? Some of the greatest advocates in the neurodiversity movement are non-speaking autistics who have full-time carers, who have managed to find a way to communicate. And, you know, when I started reading about autistic perspectives and moving away from that feeling of overwhelm in the pathological model, now don't get me wrong, 
the medical model definitely has a place. We need to know what we're talking about in terms of the medical model to seek support for our children sometimes and to understand biochemical uh, responses in the autistic body and comorbidities and mental health. But when you're a parent and you're raising a child, you know, having the word autism connected to your child doesn't mean that all of a sudden we forget who that child is and just start pathologizing them and seeking out how to fix and change everything about them and how to normalize them. I found that was just killing our family, absolutely killing us because the overwhelm of trying to navigate therapies and who to listen to and, you know, sometimes so much information that we're given takes away our power and our intuition as parents. And I had this beautiful family that I just wanted to really be connected with. And we were so disconnected because we were so stressed out and so overwhelmed and, you know, just not knowing what to do and how to help our children and how to help ourselves. So I had to really put a lid on everything and start from scratch. And for me, that meant seeking alternative perspectives. I wanted to hear from the people who were actually living autism, who had lived experience. And some of those perspectives and explanations of why we do the things that we do and what our internalised experience of being autistic is, is completely different to anything I'd ever read in a textbook or heard from a professional. And, you know, people say, when your child's diagnosed, for God's sake, don't Google the diagnosis. That's the worst thing you could do. It's the first thing that we do, let's be real. And there is nothing good about Googling autism. There's nothing good. It's, it's doom and gloom. It's fear. It's grief. It's just laden with alarmist, horrible terminology that just feels so dark and gloomy and really yuck. And I just wanted to love my children and be connected with my family. So, you know, it's taken a number of years, but we do celebrate autism and we do embody it. We, we don't just accept it. We embrace that we are autistic and it is our identity. It's not an attachment that we can get rid of. We are not, we don't consider ourselves people with autism. Because when we talk about autism like it's this extra side that we carry around with us, sometimes that really attaches a negative connotation to what autism is, like it's this thing that we have to treat. But for those of us in the autistic community that say, I am autistic, we're saying it proudly and we're not dismissing the challenges, we're not saying it's not difficult but we're saying, this is who I am. Like, I'm not a person with brunetteness. I'm not a person with children. I'm a parent. I'm a brunette. I'm not a person with femaleness. I am a female. And I choose to say I'm autistic because it is my identity. And the culture that comes with it means that we do implement strategies that work for our family and help us to live a joyous life. So if that means that we don't get involved in a lot of social activities, then that's what works for us. If, you know, we implement things that other people don't, then that's okay. And we have to know that that's okay because that's what helps us to thrive, the culture. So, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, and you did mention at the start, parents who have kids with severe challenges may find it hard to have this mindset of celebrating autism. What would you say to the parents who are listening in now who um, are finding that difficult or are in the mindset that they aren't, you know, that they don't celebrate autism? What would you say? Look, I'd say that I understand that it's absolutely difficult, you know, I don't, I don't discuss my children's challenges. Um, 
openly often because I respect their privacy and their right to dignity. But out my family lives many of the challenges that those families talk about. And, you know, there are six of us in my family and we are just all over that spectrum. There's no... I think another problem that comes along with this is that when children are diagnosed, they're given functioning labels and those are so inaccurate because people look at a person like me who's on the spectrum and think, oh, she's okay, you know, how, how is that autism? But they don't, you know, our internalised um, experience of autism is invisible and what goes on behind closed doors and how we cope is invisible. And then for a child who might be non-speaking and have those challenges that you're speaking of, sometimes they're completely dismissed around their intelligence or what they are capable of. I have really, really hard days as a person on the spectrum, as a parent. But when I change my thinking around how hard it is and why it's hard, and just remember to live in the moment. This is a moment. This difficult thing that's happening right now is a moment. And this moment is not the same as the next. Today is not the same as tomorrow. Things change. You know, there was a time in my life where I was on my knees sobbing so loud, I was sure that the neighbours would call the police. Just sobbing. I can't believe that this is our life. And I'm here today to tell you that those challenges have not gone away but you learn to think differently about them and to support your children and to connect with your children and things change. My children changed when I accepted them the way they are and learned to support them and encourage them as they are rather than running around like a chook with my head cut off, trying to fix everything, manage everything, looking after ourselves makes a huge difference. Mm. And you've mentioned before that um, one of the biggest game changers was stopping buying into that doom and gloom narrative. What were the stories that were given to you and how did you rewrite the script? Yeah, so the stories, I mean, that's all they are, they're stories. They're, nobody can say where anybody's going to be two years from now, let alone as an adult. You know, the things that we were told was, if she's not talking now, she never will. And she is talking. And, you know, she's mostly non-speaking, but she began completely non-speaking. We were given the impression that we would have this lifelong battle with a child who, you know, would just have tantrums. I think a lot of the information around why children behave the way they do is inaccurate too. So, yeah, just changing our thinking and our perspectives and learning more about autism as a way of being than a medical diagnosis. Um, and I really had to work hard, and it is a really conscious effort, to let go of everything I thought I knew about autism, everything I'd ever been told, everything I'd ever seen on Google, because there are some horrendous videos out there of children in their most vulnerable, excruciating moments that are just soul-destroying and heartbreaking. And there are things written and representations in the media of what an autistic child is that really isn't a good start for a family. When we see that after our children being diagnosed, what, you know, what hope do we have if that's what we're surrounded by? I had to change everything I was exposing myself to, what I was watching, reading, seeing, the company I was keeping, even the support groups that I was going to, because if we're exposing ourselves in groups to constant grief and trauma and look, that is part of the journey, I get that. But, you know, at some stage we want to move beyond that and into the light. So we have to let go of people, places and things that don't support where we want to be. Mm, 
Absolutely. And I even think at the initial diagnosis phase um, where doctors are giving out or psychologists are giving out that diagnosis, it does come with a lot of negative associations. You know, it's almost like, I'm sorry, your child has autism. Um, so you're not immersed in this neurodiverse culture from the start. You have to, you have to go out and seek it out. Absolutely. And that's hard because along with that narrative of autism being a disorder comes the idea that autistic adults don't know what they're talking about because our brains are disordered and we have this black and white thinking and rigid thinking and, you know, our perspective is not the right perspective. And it's not as cut and dry as that, you know. There are characteristics but we are human beings and we are all different and we are all unique. And yes, we're autistic, but we can't paint everybody with the same brush. There are, you know, so many autistic adults in the world who don't even know they're autistic and so many children in the world who are thriving that don't know they're autistic. And most people wouldn't even be able to tell and we wouldn't be saying things about them like, mm, your judgment is disordered so I can't pay attention to that. I don't think you have anything to offer me. Autism isn't something that goes away. Adults are still autistic. And when we think about our children and what we want for them and their future and what they want for themselves, you know, if we actually believe that people like me aren't autistic and we're okay, then why are we so heavily invested in early intervention and therapies? Do we not believe that our children can become these incredible adults who have these really fulfilling lives? It just, it, it's, those theories are kind of incongruent and don't really make much sense. So, yeah. Mm. Let's, um, let's talk about the misunderstandings that surround autism. What, I mean, there's a lot of them. What would you like people to know about autism and autistic people? Oh, gosh, we are so connected. People think we're really disconnected. That, that's one of the biggest things that I read about, our lack of empathy, uh, not wanting to be around other people. It's, you know, you read those words and you take that literally. I, I always did. We are so, so many of us are so deeply empathetic and empathic that it's painful. And so we develop these innate resources, these self-preserving um, strategies to shut off having too much empathy to remove ourselves from situations because, you know, we can be around a group of people and then take this experience of their energy home with us to our families or we, we need a lot of recovery time from being around people. It's not that we don't want to be around people, we do, but we are bombarded by our environment, not just the energies of human beings, but sound, sight, smell, taste, we are perceptive, you know, we, we receive information that other people don't have. There are sounds that we hear that other people just don't hear at all that are painful for us. It's just this constant bombardment. And so, you know, we, we're quite behaviour focused when we're thinking and talking about autism in society. The behaviour is just a byproduct of this internalised experience, a different way of being. And it's easy to say when something is different from what we consider typical that it's disordered, but that's not always correct either. It is a pathologising terminology that probably does more damage to the autistic community than good. So... I'd really encourage people to let go of a lot of their perspectives and understandings of what autism means based on a person's behaviour or what you're reading about it in textbooks. Mm, absolutely. And I think you touched on two other misconceptions earlier, which I want to just briefly go back to. And that was that 
um, we see autism as a spectrum and we're currently taught that there's high functioning and low functioning. But really, like you said, it is much more complex than that. Um, it's not this linear spectrum. It's really multidimensional and there's a lot of things that are going on there. And the other one was that um, the assumption that if kids can't talk, then they're not intelligent. Um, but just because kids can't speak doesn't mean they've got nothing to say. So I think there were also really two important points that you made earlier. Yeah, absolutely. So you're spot on with the whole spectrum thing. Um, I think we have this idea that it's a sliding scale and that low functioning is at one end and high functioning is at the other end. There doesn't ever seem to be an in-between. I never hear about this in-between. It's either low functioning or high functioning. And the problem there is that high functioning people, their challenges are completely overlooked and dismissed. And people who are, you know, labelled as low functioning, like you were just saying, their, their abilities and their intelligence um, is often correlated with the way they move their body. So if they're making unusual sounds or moving their bodies in certain ways, we make assumptions about their intelligence and their capacity to learn. And we're learning about this more and more because there are so many children that are, as they're growing, they're having their cognitive ability reassessed and it's been discovered that where they've been diagnosed as intellectually disabled, they're actually not. And so that, what I find heartbreaking about that is that families are exposed to this information that their children don't know what's going on and they're having conversations in their presence about them and sharing their difficulties and their challenges in the presence of their children. And I just can't imagine what that must be like for a child to grow up in an environment where they are so loved, but being exposed to this ongoing conversation about being inadequate or being disordered. So that is really problematic. The spectrum, Rebecca Burgess uh, created this really fantastic representation of the spectrum and it's this circle with these beautiful array of colors all over it and, you know, we take bits and pieces from all over that circle and that's what makes us up pretty much like just being a human being you know we all have different qualities we all have different challenges but you probably um it's probably easier to pin down what the autistic challenges are because they're more common mm. Well, aren't we all neurodiverse? Like when, we, when it comes down to it, are we all different in our ways of thinking? We are. We are. It depends on how you define thinking too. So neurodiverse or neurodiversity means everybody. Neuro means brain. Diverse means everyone. Neurodivergent or neurodivergence means anything that for lack of a better expression, deviates from the typical. So that could be bipolar, autism, a whole range of differences. We are all different, but when people say things like, aren't we all a little bit autistic or, you know, isn't, how is autism really things we're all different anyway? To a certain extent, yes. But I think um, that's a problematic thing for people to believe as well because again it's overlooking the challenges that the autistic community contend with and it, it, it's such a fine line it is such a fine line because we want to be understood and accepted as a diverse community of people who share a neurotype but we don't want to have our challenges overlooked at the same time mm. Yeah, awesome. That's great. That's a really nice way of clarifying that. Um, what I want to talk about now is intervention because when kids receive a diagnosis, there can be this huge rush to start intervention ASAP and dive into whatever it is they've been, whatever information they've been handed. How, um, 
how can parents find where to start and find their tribe and what is the right fit for them? That is such a great question and it's such a challenging question. <laughs> um, I hate the word intervention, if I can be honest. It, it's, again, an alarmist word, like we must intervene. What are we intervening with? You know, it, it brings, again, this perception that there's something not okay and we have to work really hard to stop it from happening. And the reality is that, you know, when you're autistic, you're autistic. But I understand also that there are therapies that actually support um, autistic people. And that's what I promote, finding therapies that support the needs of autistic people. Now, I, can't, I never tell families what to do because I can't do that. Nobody can tell families what to do. And I just would never want to add to that total overload of information anyway. But if I can say that is the most difficult decision I ever had to make around my children being autistic, how to navigate therapies. And I will say this, compliance therapies um, are a really difficult thing to talk about. They're not encouraged by the autistic community because, you know, what we're presented with is what we know to be evidence-based therapies. And then there's also a body of evidence about many autistic adults who did engage in these therapies as children who now have post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, in saying that everybody is different, but I always, always promote supportive therapies. So in our family, we have this beautiful occupational therapist who much like yourself, you know, works with the families to find what is right for them and it's taken me a long time, but I'm a bit of a bulldog parent, so I will let people know what I want from my children and what I find unacceptable. And that's been a really tricky journey. You know, I've had my children in certain therapies that didn't work out for us, that didn't support um, autism acceptance, that sought to fix and change certain behaviours, rather than looking at... Um, the behaviour as, again, a byproduct, And I don't want my children to be these little people who are just reeling off scripts and pretending to be someone they're not. I want to support them to be the best that they can be. So rather than normalising, I want to actualise. So we're taking a human being and we're recognising their strengths and we're you know, helping them to meet their greatest potential. So, you know, one of my children doesn't have therapies at all because she's thriving and she's never known anything different than to be raised in a home where her neurology is celebrated and accepted. She doesn't even know that there are other opinions about autism in the world. Um, and then we have another child who has speech therapy because she's learning to use a communication aid and, you know, an OT. So, gosh, it's so different for every family. But I would say listen to this, listen to your intuition, listen to your gut and check in with your child. Pay attention to how they're behaving after therapy sessions. Pay attention to changes in their daily routine because they won't always have the language to express what's going on inside. So by paying attention to their behaviour, we can get a really good insight into how whether something's working for them or not. Mm, absolutely. The behaviour is the cue. Um, looking back, what do you know now that you wish you knew at the time of diagnosis? What has changed? How has it changed your world getting the diagnoses for your kids and yourself? Oh, that's a huge question. Um, what do I wish I knew? Do you know what? It's been a really tough journey. There are parts that I would not change. Most of it I wouldn't change because I wouldn't know what I know now. Um, you know, I, I do regret that 
I spent a lot of time pathologising my little girl who's non-speaking. I didn't recognise her intelligence for, you know, maybe two years. And everything I thought about her was based on what I read about autism. So I wish, I do really wish that I had gone with my gut and just connected with my children the way we connect with our children as parents, you know, that that word autism really kind of disconnected us for a long time. Um, and I really wish that I had listened to my intuition. But, you know, in saying that, I, there's not a lot I do regret about the past because we are in such a beautiful place now as a family. Mm, I love that. Before we head to the two rapid fire questions, I've got one more question that I want to ask you and it may sort of link into what we just covered, but what have been some of your greatest lessons so far? What have you learned along the autism journey that has just been really life changing for you? Not to pathologize my child. So you're right. It does link in with what we're just talking about. An example of that would be, you know, I am a big researcher and I think parents are in general, but also being autistic means that I just have this need for information. There's never enough information. And because I was studying um, medical science at the time, I was reading a lot about um, autism. And my little girl, I think she was about three or four at the time. This is my non-speaking child. And I had read that children on the spectrum don't sleep well because, you know, they don't have enough uh, melatonin and I thought okay I'm going to make her room really dark so I got really heavy blinds and I made sure the door was shut and there was no glimmer of light in her room at night and I kept finding her on the floor during the night and picking her up and popping her back in bed and thinking what now what is going on and just analyzing it from every perspective from a textbook that I knew I had read and researched and, you know, making her room really comfortable but really dark and getting rid of any sound and you know, just trying all these things. And that went on for maybe six months. And then one morning I went in and it was still dark, I remember this, and she was on the floor again. And I thought, you know, okay, maybe she just likes to sleep on the floor because I did as a child. But what was actually going on was that I realised she's laying under the window every time she's on the floor. She was trying to get light. She was afraid of the dark. And I was making the room dark mm. because I believed it would help her sleep. And so what happened there was I was just reading into this, you know, pathology around autism. This is what she needs because it's what the book says. And just overlooking the fact that she's a child. She is a child who was afraid of the dark, like most children at that age. And so I started to do things differently. And those are things that I find really difficult to look back on. But these are the things that can happen when we just define our child based on textbooks. And um, I think we need to be really careful about that. Mm. That story, Christy, just gave me goosebumps because we do, we tend to look at the textbooks and go through everything and try every different strategy. And then sometimes we just need to take a minute, stop, tap into what is actually going on and work out. Um, you know, it's really about becoming the detective in the scenario, you know, working out for your child what is going on. Um, so, yeah, that's such an important message. Alrighty, let's start to wrap it up. Um, we'll head to the two rapid fire questions. Was there anything else that you wanted to say to people who are on the summit before we get to the, the questions? Is there anything else? I don't think so. I okay, think I think so. we've covered a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so number one, what is your main message for parents of children on the spectrum? Intuition first, connection first, always connection no therapy in the world will help your child if they are not connected with you and with any therapist. Relationship, connection, intuition, always. Love it. Number two, what words of wisdom would you whisper to a child on the spectrum? 
oh, that makes me feel emotional. Um, you know, the world needs all kinds of people and you are born exactly as you are to be born with purpose, with beauty, with soul. You are perfect as you are. And sometimes you will receive the message that that is not true, but that doesn't make it true. You are amazing and incredible. And there are so many other people in the world who are also autistic, who have the same challenges. And it does get easier, I promise you it gets easier. And life can be really happy and full of joy. Oh, more goosebumps. Thank you, Christy. That is amazing. So touching. Um, what is the best place for people to connect with you? You mean like... Online, yeah. Instagram, websites. So I am on Facebook. You can look me up at Intune Pathways. I'm on Instagram under um, bottom slash. I'm not sure what I'm Underscore. Called. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> underscore Christy Forbes. Or you can find my website at www.christyforbes.com or www.intunepathways.com.au. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christy, for joining us on the Autism Summit. Thank you for having me. Hey, guys. I hope you have had a lovely weekend. Now, before we dive into it, I want to acknowledge you and thank you for taking the time and making the space in your already busy life to tune in today. You are absolutely amazing. Um, today, we are talking all about women on the spectrum and being diagnosed later in life. And I'm speaking with Christy Forbes, who is an autism and neurodiversity support specialist and director of the Intunes Pathway. She is an educator, accomplished childhood behavioural and family specialist, and most importantly, a parent to four autistic daughters. Christy herself was also diagnosed autistic at 33 years of age. Christy is a national speaker on topics ranging from autism and neurodiversity to parenting children with diverse needs. She is a passionate advocate for the neurodiversity movement and helps to create custom-made joyous lives for the extraordinary family. Welcome, Christy. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I am so excited. I have, you know what, I only stumbled across you quite recently on Instagram and instantly everything that you were saying just resonated with me. So I'm so excited to have you on, um, on the podcast. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Now, we always start the podcast by hopping in this time machine and going back um, on a little journey. So I'd love it if you could talk to us about what growing up was like for you because you were autistic, but you didn't know it. Mm, yeah, good question. Great <laughs> question. <laughs> I think if you asked any autistic adult what growing up was like, they'll say very challenging. Um, you know, I knew I was different. I always knew I was different. I didn't quite understand how or why. I thought there was something wrong with me and I think I mostly saw myself as a broken version of a neurotypical. And um, so I was always seeking, always seeking how to be different, always, you know, I want to be brutally honest about this. I, I looked at faiths and denominations and religions and self-help books and courses and I sat with psychiatrists and psychologists and as a teenager I was suicidal. I was. Um, and, you know, I didn't... Growing up... One of my saving graces was growing up in the country because my connection with nature, and many autistic people will say this, you know, it's just this beautiful sensory-based connection, this energetic, you know, resonance with the world. And I always found it really grounding and it was my safe place where I could breathe. But also, you know, many of us um, are growing up in 
in families where there are neurodivergent bloodlines. So there might be lots of people in our family history that are undiagnosed autistics and they just don't know. So we also consider the fact that we're just like mum or just like Uncle Brian or Aunt Jenny, she was anxious or, you know, Uncle Rod had a very dry sense of humour and would often offend people, that sort of stuff. So that, would, that even more so led to me thinking, why am I so different? Because I think I was much more sensitive than most of my family members. I was hypersensitive to everything and I just felt on such an intense level my depth of feeling was so intense that it was painful so that was hard with that are you referring to emotional sensitivity or sensory sensitivities or both all of it <laughs> all of it so when we say that autistic people are sensitive oh we mean like hypersensitive in every sense of the word so emotionally you know, my smell, my hearing, just everything right across the board, our bodies, our skin. And it's not the same for every person on the spectrum, obviously. It um, changes. But for me, I also have pro uh, sensory processing disorder. So there was that as well. And there was being academically gifted but not being able to learn in a classroom because I'm so easily distracted and always the joker. So to mask what I was feeling on the inside, I was the funny kid in class and always up the back running around, you know, doing crazy things. And I know my friends from high school might see this and just know exactly what I'm talking about. But I was so distracted by the energy of other people. Just having someone sitting next to me meant that I couldn't get any work done because I could feel their presence and I could hear everything. Like it was just so hard, so hard. Mm. And so what, what's it been like to be a late identified autistic woman? Oh, transformational. Has changed my life. The first and most significant thing about it is that I can like myself. I can love myself unconditionally. I can understand that, you know, I'm not failing at life. I'm not inadequate. I'm not this person who, no matter how I try, I just can't get it right. Because when you grow up undiagnosed, these are some of the things that we think about ourselves. And, you know, as young people, we're comparing ourselves. So when you've been comparing yourself all your life to your friends and family and other people and you just feel like you're not measuring up, when someone says, when that psychologist said to me, you are on the autism spectrum, I cried. I cried because I grieved the life that I may have had had I known I was autistic. And I cried because of the relief to know that gosh, I'm actually not doing anything wrong. I'm fighting against who I am intrinsically, innately, organically. And there's nothing that I ever could have done that would have changed any of what I've been fighting all my life so I could finally rest. Mm. And did that diagnosis come about because you had children diagnosed on the spectrum first and then had that realisation? Yeah, definitely. I remember... Um, you know, there were lots of clues along the way, definitely. Being training for my teaching degree and, you know, doing this training about Asperger's back then and looking at all the characteristics and just thinking, oh, how is this Asperger's? If this is what Asperger's is, then everybody must have Asperger's. But realistically, no, just you, Christy, just you. Um, but, yes, definitely my children being diagnosed led me into reading things about autism and paying closer attention to my body and how I would regulate and how I would cope and then realising, oh, hmm, autistic. How did your family and friends respond to this diagnosis? Do you know what? I have no idea. I've never asked because I don't want to know. <laughs> I just... What? 
it, I suppose when you told them in the facial expressions, were they shocked or was it for them like, oh, that makes sense? Or neither? Well, a bit of both really. Like, um, do you know what? It's helped to, my mum and I have always had a really turbulent relationship. We're very, very similar. And when I was diagnosed, I learned so much about it and I just went, huh, this is interesting. And so we started having this ongoing conversation about, you know, what autism is and how it might present in adult women. And so she's been learning as well. And it's great in that sense that it's brought a lot of healing to many relationships with others that I've had because I can see them in a different light and I can see things that, I'm responsible for that I may have misunderstood or I may have been really blunt but there were lots of people that went oh yeah we knew you were different that makes sense or they went we're well, definitely different but autistic are you sure so yeah a range of responses and do you think that plays into the fact that we have a lot of misunderstandings around autism, that people don't know what it is? So really, you're on the spectrum? Oh, no, you don't look like you are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and if we can just touch on you don't look like you are. You know, sometimes, sometimes autistic people know other autistic people, even when they don't know they're autistic. We are really focused on behaviour and behaviour is just a physical expression of the internalised experience of being autistic. So we move our body in certain ways to regulate or to feel more comfortable or safe um, or to express happiness or sadness. And so autistic adults like myself, many of us, we may not stim in public, we may not show you those physical byproducts of our neurotype, our autistic brains. We might do it behind closed doors or we've learned, you know, over our lifetime that that's not acceptable. There's been social consequences for a lot of our physical behaviour. So we've learned to put a lid on that and so we don't appear to be autistic or, you know, I've learnt to make eye contact and I'm always thinking about it as I'm doing it. You know, is this too intense? Should I look away? Yeah, I should probably look away now. Oh, am I being rude because I'm looking away? And there's this constant process of thinking and analysing everything my body does in every moment of engagement with another human being. And people don't know that because it's invisible. It's in my head and in my heart. So, you know, this, these are a lot of the things that we miss about adults and we don't know that they're on the spectrum. But if we look at their coping, you know, there's alcoholism and drug addiction and eating disorders and comorbid mental health challenges. There's this whole other world attached to being an autistic adult that people don't know about. Mm. Can you share any more insight on that? Like what it is like to be an adult on the spectrum? How is the world, how do you view the world? How is it different? I would say um, I'm so connected and respectful and appreciative and grateful for the beauty, the beauty in the world. I'm drawn to beautiful people, places and things and I'm really adversely affected by things that aren't so lovely. So... It's a very human thing to be angry or to be sad. But if I'm in an environment where there's an angry person, I internalise that as being my fault, that I'm responsible for that. And I take on their emotional experience as my own. And that's often referred to as being empathic. But it's a very common thing for people on the autism spectrum to do. Um, I, I still feel at a depth that is almost unimaginable. So my feelings, when I'm sad, I'm not just sad, I'm completely consumed and disabled by that feeling of sadness. So I'll find it hard to get on with my day if I'm feeling sad. If I've got something important on in a day, like an interview like this, 
you know, as much as I love it and enjoy it, the energy around it means that I have to make sure I've got nothing else on in my day so that I can do this and then I can recover. And when I say recover, it's not about this being a terrible thing to do. It's fantastic. But emotion and energy, so much of our energy goes into the things that we love to do as well as the things that we find difficult to do and we always need recovery time. And the world doesn't quite always understand or accept that about adults because there's an expectation that we'll just cope, we'll just put our big girl, big girl pants on and we'll just get on with life. And, you know, we do that and we try that and then we might burn out. So, yeah, it's difficult to be that person in a world that doesn't quite have all the information about, you know, what, what it is that we contend with. Mm, absolutely. I want to dive into the differences between females and males on the spectrum. How do they present differently? We haven't really spoken about this on the podcast before and I thought you'd be the perfect person to get on to have a chat to us so parents out there who do have girls on the spectrum um, can get a little bit more insight from a woman on the spectrum. Okay, sure. It's a really good question and a really good topic. Um, so I think it's important to be clear about this first. There is no real internalised difference for anybody of any gender or, you know, people identify as all kinds of genders now with a gender diverse community, especially the autistic community. A lot of us are gender diverse or gender fluid. So the internalised experience of being autistic, there's no real significant difference across gender. But what you were saying about how it presents can be significantly different, yes. So that falls in line with society's um, perpetuation of gender roles or stereotypes and how we've been raised, particularly adults, because, you know, we come from a generation where little girls should be ladies and sit a certain way and behave a certain way. So... You know, if I think about primary school and the school environment, it would be more acceptable for a little girl to be spending her lunch break in the library reading books. Most people wouldn't bat an eyelid at that. Because girls by nature are received as often, you know, having a more subtle energy and being more quiet and more socially acceptable more nurturing. So the expectations of little girls are very different to the expectations of little boys. Little boys, um, you know, in my schooling years, would be involved mainly in sporting groups. So the bell for lunch would go and all the boys would go and kick a footy. If you didn't fit into that, if you weren't inclined to enjoy or engage in sports, then you would be seen as different and it would be obvious. And that's just one example. So, you know, we've only got to look at the history of children diagnosed as autistic. And it was believed for a long time that it was predominantly a male disorder. So we're learning now that actually females, a lot of females are also autistic, but our presentation is different. So... You know, what I see a lot of and what I have seen a lot of in my work as a specialist with families are little girls who might be anxious, who might be gifted learners, who might not readily share their feelings for fear that they'll upset others. They may feel responsible for the emotions of others and the experience of others, like I was talking about before. Um, they can be quite nurturing and taking responsibility for everybody around them, wanting to solve everybody's problems and fix everything. They might have a great need for controlling people, places and things to make themselves feel safer. And we just get really, really good at eye contact and engaging and connecting with other people because in my experience, there was this expectation that as a female, 
I would have to be really good at that to survive in the world, connecting with other people. And I was so, look, I was so bad at sport as a kid. I hated it. I loathed it. And I feel so sorry for any child on the spectrum who has had that experience too. Some of my children, it's painful. It's painful to not fit into what all your peers are doing because then, you know, we work so hard at not being found out. We work so hard, even when we don't know we're autistic, we don't want other people to know who we really are or we just want to fit in, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think girls are better at imitating those socially appropriate behaviours and much better at masking than the boys. And that's sort of what I've read from the readings of people on the spectrum when they talk about it. That's what they say is that they are much better at showing um, this mask, someone who they're not. And, and from what I've read, that can be really damaging to autistic people. Yeah, and it doesn't quite fit in also with this myth that autistic people don't feel empathy because women, you know, that stereotype again or that expectation, that gender role is that we will be nurturing and caring and kind and giving. And, you know, there are a lot of women who will act that out but not so much feel it, or there will just be people who will fit that role of being nurturing and caring and kind and loving, and people will think, well, you, and I hear this all the time, you can't be autistic because, you know, you're really, I've had said to me, you're too warm, you're too social. Well, actually, being too social is something that I've, being social is something that I've learned through observation of watching my peers and practising and being warm, <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that, to be honest. Autistic people are often beautiful, warm human beings. Mm, mm, it's so interesting. And it's such an interesting topic to dive into because there are so many just misunderstandings around it, I think. And I think it does take people like yourself who are out there and talking about it and bringing some um, different perspectives to it and perspectives that are really valid because you are on the spectrum and you are living and breathing it. So I think that's really important. Um, Thank you. What are some of the challenges that you've had to learn to cope with and navigate as an autistic person? Mm, emotional regulation is a big one for me. People, that never goes away. <laughs> you know, we might mask it better. Um, we might present, you know, we're not having tantrums in public. We're not having meltdowns in the presence of, you know, other people. But we're still, I'm still having meltdowns, trust me on that, behind closed doors. And, yeah, that's really, really hard. Like I was saying before, Sadness isn't just sadness, it's being consumed by the emotion. And, you know, I'm 40 this year and I've spent my life trying to find solutions for not being too sad or too excited or too angry or too happy. And at the end of the day, I just have to accept that this is how I am and I actually respect and appreciate that. But it is challenging. It's really challenging. What would a meltdown look like for you? Yeah, so a meltdown could be a range of things. Um, so I, when I feel a meltdown coming on, usually it's because I'm really overwhelmed. I've had, and you know what? I am in this moment going to take responsibility for this. I'm still learning because I was diagnosed six years ago, so I'm still learning about, my limits, what I can handle, how much I can handle. And that's that takes a lot of trial and error. So I will still go into denial about being autistic and go, oh, I can handle that and that and that. Yeah, I'll do that at 11 o'clock tonight and I'll do that at 4 o'clock tomorrow morning. And, you know, it'll go well for about half an hour and then I will find myself just feeling so tense, my entire body feeling tense. I can't cope with noise anymore. My headphones go on. I'm extremely tactile defensive, so don't touch me. 
please don't stand too close to me, don't come near me. And then I find I'll be pacing my home and deep breathing to the point where I nearly pass out because my breathing is so strong. So I'm trying to regulate. Um, now, if my children are in the home with me, obviously this isn't something that they're exposed to and I've had to work really hard at that as well. So I might go into my room, into the closet and just do some deep breathing, scream into a pillow, many of the same strategies that most of us use when we're stressed. But yeah, so it could be that. It could be a shutdown as well. So um, just not being able to speak anymore, not being able to think anymore, not being able to process information or just losing a handle on what's going on around me. It's like the world closes in. And this doesn't happen often for me because I manage my life in such a way that um, it supports me, my environments support me, my lifestyle supports me. But like I said, trial and error, and there are things that I will be affected by and it will be a new learning experience for me. Mm. Now you're autistic and you're raising four autistic daughters i would love it if we can explore this what does the household look like what is life like for you and do you think it makes it easier or harder being autistic yourself raising four autistic daughters obviously you have a lot of insight but it would have its challenges as well so can we explore that yeah I, i've got no idea whether it makes it easier because i've never been non-autistic so <laughs> good um, point <laughs> I've only got, I thought I was for a long time. I thought that, you know, I wasn't autistic and um, that was really hard. That was really hard. And I think being diagnosed did change that for me, my parenting, because there was a period where I went, ah, oh, this is why I understand this behaviour. Because I used to think, okay, if I'm not autistic, how do I understand what my children are doing? You know, they might be repeatedly clapping their hands in a certain way and getting really frustrated and I just get they're trying to achieve a certain pitch in the sound of their clap. And I just used to think, how do I know this? That's obviously because I was the same as a child. Our house, what does it look like? What does life look like? You know, it's up and down. It's a roller coaster. We laugh a lot. Humour is so important to us, you know, having a sense of humour. Not getting snowed under with doom and gloom narrative. Not, and this is probably a really big challenge for autistic people. When something happens in my world that I find difficult to cope with, my brain has this tendency to expand that out into this universal force. So rather than one person having said something that upset me, I'll go, everybody hates me. Or, you know. Catastrophizing. Yes, absolutely. So I can get quite catastrophic in my thinking. Um, so I really have to make a conscious effort of reminding myself, this is just an isolated incident. It's going to be okay. Now, when you're raising children who are autistic and they have challenges, and your heart goes out to them. And sometimes, you know, I feel quite powerless because there's a lot of things that I just have to help them ride the wave of. Um, constantly reminding myself and my children, this is just for now, just for today, just right now, just this moment. It may not be the same tomorrow, but let's not even go there. Let's not even think about tomorrow at this point. Just stay centred, grounded in this moment. What can we do right now to support ourselves? So there's a lot of coming back to the moment, living in the moment. Sometimes it's really challenging. Sometimes we have days where uh, I don't, you know, I get to the end of the day and I'm tactile defensive and I'm on the verge of a meltdown. And then there are days where, you know, more often than not, I, 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 I know this is cliche and I know people say this all the time, but uh, I just, I ask myself all the time, why me? 
why do I get to have this incredible experience of life where I'm raising these four amazing autistic human beings? It has opened up this vortex for me where I get this experience that other people don't get. And it's not always easy, but it is always, always rewarding, always. Mm. That is such a beautiful perspective because, like you said, a lot of parents will buy into this doom and gloom narrative, um, which is easy to do because, like you said, um, you know, even on the internet, looking up things, as soon as you type in autism, a lot of negative things can come up. Um, and what I love is that you do um, celebrate autism in your own ways. And this sort of leads into the neurodiversity movement. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that, what it actually means and, um, yeah, how you celebrate autism. Okay. So the neurodiversity movement, um, it's often really misunderstood. It is a movement, um, you know, for people who identify neurodiversity encompasses everybody really so neuro meaning brain and diversity obviously meaning all kinds of people so it covers everybody within that movement um, is you know the neurodivergent community so neurodivergent meaning anything that deviates from what we consider typical i don't think that exists but anything that isn't what you would expect a person to be so you know that can encompass all kinds of things ADHD autism bipolar lots and lots of different um, neurodiversities so what I love about the neurodiversity movement is that it sees for me because I'm autistic I'll talk about autism obviously it regards autism as a difference rather than a disorder now, when people hear that, they think, you know, okay, it's, it's all well and lovely to romanticise autism, but what about the challenges? And they think that the neurodiversity movement completely dismisses and disregards the fact that we have challenges. And that could not be further from the truth. So we absolutely um, acknowledge, recognise and accept that there are many challenges and you know we know this because this is our lived experience and we I, I read so many articles written by professionals um, in particular psychologists who you know don't agree with the neurodiversity movement because they have this understanding that we go no treatment no therapy nothing and it's not true what we do advocate for is supporting a person, supporting a person. So rather than normalising them, actualising a human being, taking their strengths and working with those. We move away from compliance therapies or therapies that seek to fix and change or correct a person from being autistic and we work in alignment with autism acceptance. And... I think that people are scared by that because they're afraid for their children's futures and they think that the neurodiversity movement only really suits people who identify as autistic like me, people who are considered high functioning, no functioning labels in the neurodiversity movement either. Autism is autism and some of our most excellent greatest advocates are non-speaking with significant support needs and full-time carers who are able to communicate their thoughts through a whole range of um, assisted communication so it really embraces autistic people it's a community for people to feel good and positive to have a positive autistic identity mm. and while we're on this topic i do want to talk about person first language because you know what it's really interesting when I went to university I specifically remember being taught person first language um, we were taught how important it was to respect the person before the label so 
because the disability is only a small part of the whole person. And when we say a person with autism rather than autistic person, it doesn't confine them to this stereotype. So I have always said person with autism or person on the spectrum and out of habit, I continue to do that. Mm -hmm. But what I've learned um, from people like yourself is that, well, it's okay to say autistic person. And I'd love to get your insight into why is that? Because there will be professionals who Mm -hmm. are listening in as well and there will be parents who um, maybe don't understand it. Can you shed some light on what, what language we should be using and how it all works. Yeah, so I understand exactly where you're coming from because I've studied certain, you know, in certain fields and also been encouraged to do the same thing. Um, Now, person first language is when we say person with autism. Identity first language is when we say I am autistic. I personally am okay for an autistic person or a person with autism to choose what they want. I choose I am autistic. Now, our um, governing body for autism in Victoria, AMAZE, formerly Autism Victoria, uh, released a statement saying, based on what we're learning from autistic adults, we're changing our language to reflect the preferences of the autistic community, which is to use uh, identity first language. Now, the thing with, you know, you were saying the disability is a small part of the person. Oh, gosh, that's a tricky, it, it's so Again, tricky. I know. And even using the word disability, I wanted to ask, you know, is yeah. that offensive? And because, you know, I suppose disorder, you know, it's autism spectrum disorder. That's how it's currently labelled. And I suppose it just does bring up all these questions around how people in the neurodiversity movement, how you perceive this. So in the neurodiversity movement, we look at the social model of disability. And what that means is that a person, you know, for me as an autistic person, when I'm in an environment where I'm supported and accepted and valued exactly how I am, I'm not experiencing necessarily my disability. When society doesn't support a person in the way that they need to be supported, so, and this, could, this is right across the board for any disability, But specifically for me, if I'm in an environment where there are expectations of me to do things that are unrealistic based on being autistic, then my disability will be obvious and I will experience my disability based on the fact that I'm not being supported by society or socially. So it's not wrong to say that autistic people have a disability. But we don't, in the neurodiversity movement, we don't necessarily, we don't like disorder language. There's no functioning labels. There's no language around um, autism spectrum disorder. We don't use terms like that. We just say autism or autistic. Now, the thing with identity first language for me is that when I, when you say, um, when we say a person with autism, it sounds like they're carrying a bag around with them something that they can just drop off somewhere or get rid of or separate from themselves now autism is a neurological experience it's you know it is a neurotype it's my brain everything about me comes from my brain the way i process the world the way i receive information the way i understand things the way i think feel the way my body physically response to my environment, the way I receive touch, the way I experience the sensory world, all, every single part of my being comes from my neurotype, having an autistic brain. So I'm not a person with autism. I am autistic in the same way that I'm not a person with brunetteness. I'm a brunette. I'm not a person with femaleness, I am female. I'm not a person with children, I'm a parent. Now I know this won't work for everybody and like I said, I'm happy for people to choose whatever they want because I don't tell people what to do. 
What I, what I don't agree with is when people who are not autistic tell autistic people how they should identify. That is very triggering and, and it's you know, often offensive as well. And also when we say person with autism, it almost encourages people to believe that autism is something that we can kind of just shirk, just treat and get rid of or it will dissipate. No matter how a person ever presents in the world with a diagnosis of autism, we are lifelong autistic. It doesn't matter if we're not stimming in public. It doesn't matter how our bodies present. It doesn't matter whether we make eye contact. It doesn't matter what you see when you look at us. It doesn't matter how well we speak. It doesn't matter if we don't appear to have challenges. If we are autistic, we are autistic. It is an internal experience of being and it's a different experience of being so when we say I am autistic I really encompass you know everything about my being I am an autistic being so that's how I um, you know identify as an autistic person and that is in line with the ND movement or the neurodiversity movement mm. It's so interesting because honestly, like until quite recently, you know, within the last year or two, like I said, I was saying, you know, person on the spectrum and I did think it was really offensive. I honestly thought it was offensive to say autistic. Um, So I suppose it is just this massive um, perspective shift for us too as professionals to understand that that's your preferred way of yeah of how you like to be spoken to and about um so yeah it's a really interesting topic so thank you so much for that well i did have an occupational therapist contact me actually one day after reading my post about autistic children and she said look i'm a student in my final year of ot and i just want to let you know that it's offensive to refer to people as autistic people and i shared with her what i've just shared with you but see I think that that um, being offended and and the negative feeling that comes with the word autistic comes from, oh gosh, and and I relate to this in my early days where I didn't know I was autistic. Being a parent and not wanting my child defined by a word that has had such a horrible, negative, pathological model attached to it that is defining and is limiting in many regards. So I think that people are afraid that their children will be caged into this definition of who they are and what they're capable of based on that word. And so they don't want to use the word to define their child. That's why I love the ND movement because we're just, you know, we're here and we're saying, but autism is, it's okay, you know. It's not what we've thought it has been for so long. It's so much more than that. Mm. And are you finding now that there are a lot more parents who are getting diagnoses because their kids are getting diagnosed? Are you finding that? Yeah, I am. Um, It's always the dads, though. It's always the dads. And, you know, I have so many mums contact me and even friends and say, oh, you know, they get it from their father. And I'll meet with families in my practice. So many times, you know, I've met with families whose children are diagnosed autistic and the mum will say, you know, jokingly, oh, they get it from their dad. Yet mum, much like me, just never stops talking, is so knowledgeable about certain topics. You know, all the clues are there. But again, referring back to our conversation before, you know, we could never have known during our time as children that we might be autistic. But yes, a lot of parents are being diagnosed and probably not enough, probably not as many as there should be because there are a lot of undiagnosed adults. Mm. Let's head to your work now because your work currently involves supporting autistic families. So what drove you to start work in this specific area? Um, my own suffering and it was, it was, 
it was really dark, coming from a really dark, what felt like powerless and hopeless place um, as a parent. And, you know, I come from a background of working with families as an early childhood behavioural specialist, which is really interesting. Um, but I always just value the connection with the families and supporting the children. So I had that experience, also my teaching experience and early childhood experience. But being a parent was a totally different thing, totally different. It didn't matter how much training I'd had about autism. I knew nothing when my children were diagnosed, absolutely nothing. And, you know, buying into the pathology model, believing everything that was written about autism and defining my children via textbooks and seminars and workshops. And don't get me wrong, those things can be helpful. But I also, because I'm an autistic person, I take things very literally. And, you know, I'm a concrete thinker. So if I read autistic people lack empathy, then I'm going to believe autistic people lack empathy. So I found myself in this space with my family where we were so stressed and so disconnected. I felt I could never be enough for my children. I felt so inadequate and so disempowered and like I just would never have as much knowledge as professionals um, and just trying to navigate everything and none of it was positive. It was always, you know, we we're always chasing our tail as a family. What do we have to do next? What do we need to work on? Speech, OT, you know, just everything all the time and moving through paperwork and reading deficit-based reports and then going to support groups where everybody was talking about that and crying about that and feeling down and out. And then I was watching documentaries about the horrors of autism and, you know, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of space in our family life for positivity because we just felt like we were treading water. So, you know, coming out of that, I noticed that there weren't a lot of people talking about a positive experience of autism. And when I went looking for that, I found it in autistic adults who were writing about their lived experience, which encouraged me to be vulnerable. And this is what is not encouraged. When you're an autistic person growing up, you do everything in your power to hide what's in here and what's in here. So when you get to adulthood and you have this, you know, we don't have, you know, when you see in storybooks and there's little thought bubbles coming out of people's heads, ours needs to be like the size of the planet. Well, mine does because so many thoughts. I was encouraged by autistic adults to start writing about my experience and professionals and parents have been drawn to that and autistic people offering me solidarity and community and, you know, people are desperate for the permission to love and accept their children right now. Not in 10 years when they can talk or in 20 years when they're living independently. They just need someone to tell them it's okay it's okay. Your child is incredible. They really are everything you know they are. So I work on helping parents step away from the fear and the terror and everything they believe they should be feeling and moving into the light and, you know, exposing them to a different perspective. Mm, I love that. And if the people who are listening into this podcast today haven't already checked out Christy's blog, I highly recommend it. Your words are just so touching. Honestly, every time I read it, it's just, it's amazing. I love, you have such a knack for that. It's very impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's amazing. Well, we might head to the five rapid fire questions now and start to wrap things up. Um, Number one, what is one habit that parents can implement today? Uh, connecting with your children, away from therapy, away from, you know, empty your head out and just spend time with your child and just be, just be, just follow their lead. 
You know, if they're throwing balls at the wall, join in with them, connect with them, just prioritise that connection. Absolutely. Number two, what do people never ask you that you wish they did? What do I love about being autistic? You Tell know? me. Let's explore. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be rapid fire, but... I'd you have it. asked me. I just, you know, there are challenges, but I love my depth of feeling. My greatest challenge is also my greatest love about my brain. You know, the way I can connect with people, the way I appreciate diverse experiences, the, the way I'm drawn to all the beautiful things in the world. That's what I love about being autistic. Mm, beautiful. Number three, what book would you recommend that all parents read? Neurotribes by Steve Silverman, for sure. I mean, if you would like the history of autism, it's in that book, definitely. Great. Number four, what is one of your top unfinished bucket list items? Travelling. Yeah, definitely travelling. I've been overseas once, going overseas twice this year. Just, yeah, yeah, really, really excited for that. Yeah, and you're heading to Singapore. I am. <laughs> and what are you speaking at? Can you tell us a bit about that? I'm speaking at the Asia Pacific Autism Conference in Singapore and I'm speaking about basically what we're talking about now. So moving families out of the darkness and into the light into a new perspective of autism. Congratulations. That is awesome. And number five, if you could only offer one piece of advice to parents, what would it be? Trust your intuition. What you know about your child is true. It absolutely is true. What you know and feel about your child, who you know them to be, is true. It doesn't matter about any words that you read in books or what any professional tells you. Your child is lovable and incredible and valuable right now. I love that. Thank you. Um, and how can everyone connect with you and find out more about your work? So you can find me on Facebook at Intune Pathways or uh, on Instagram at underscore Christy Forbes or uh, my website, www.christyforbes.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christy, for joining us on the podcast. Thank you for having me. See ya.